we'll finish this um, beautiful, wonderful chapter 105 that we are in the middle of learning, uh, talking about lots and lots of miracles that Hashem performed for our forefathers. Um, so last week we stopped at, we were at uh, chapter 105 and we are at verse 20, 23, 23, 24, yeah. So um, we, what we were looking at so far in this, um, in this chapter, which if just to remind you, this was written by King David when the Aron, when the Holy Ark came back to Yerushalayim. And um, it's, a, it's a, a chapter full of different miracles that Hashem performed for the Jewish people um, in Mitzrayim, beginning with how Hashem first sent Yosef down to Mitzrayim. So ultimately, everything was in place when Yaakov and his family needed food when there was famine in Eretz Yisrael. And the purpose, why was there a famine, was so that the tribes should end up in Mitzrayim. And as we're going to see, everything has a purpose. Nothing happens randomly. So the last thing we looked at last week was how uh, Yosef went from being uh, at the bottom of the pit to becoming the second in command, almost like the king in Mitzrayim. And, and that's where we left off. Um, one of the things that we spoke about last week um, earlier on in the chapter, and this is a theme we've been going back to, is how Hashem made promises to our forefathers and that those promises will be kept. That Hashem promised Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, to Abraham, to Yitzchak, and to Yaakov. And that when Hashem makes a promise, he keeps his promise, certainly for when it is for the good. Sometimes Hashem will renege when he says there will be a punishment or a consequence, but never when it is for a gift or an inheritance, etc. And we had looked last week where the Dabra Melech referred in Pasuk Tes, um, where we said, Zoha la Olam Briso, Dova Tziva la Elef Do, Asha Korasa Savram or Shabuasa li Yitzchok, where Hashem remembers his promise. Uh, the word that he has commanded to a thousand generations that he forged with Abraham and his, and his oath to Yitzchok. And we noticed over there that the name Yitzchak was written with a sin. And we talked about that. I saw another very beautiful um, a comment from, uh, from the Tzemach Tzedek, also on the spelling. Some, sometimes Yitzchak Avinu is spelt with Yud Sadi Ches Kuf, Yitzchak with a tzadi, and sometimes it's with a samach. And um, another beautiful explanation on the spelling is that the two names, um, Yitzchak and Yitzchak, Yitzchak, 
the, the, the names are almost the same, just the letter sh Sin and the letter Sadi. So um, the letter Sadi is the first letter of the word Sara, right? You might may be familiar. Sara means a difficulty. That's where the word Saras comes from, the Yiddish word. When someone is, is experiencing a difficulty. So Yitzchak with a Tzadi, the Tzadi represents, it's the first letter of the word Sara, which means a difficulty. On the other hand, Yitzchak, with a sin, sin is the letter that stands for simcha and sasson, which is joy and celebration. And, um, and in the future, redemption, the tzaddik, the tzara, is going to be replaced with simcha and sasson, with joy and redemption. And then Yitzchak, will be referred to always as Yitzchak. In the Torah, we find that um, Yitzchak is referred to sometimes as Yitzchak and sometimes as Yitzchak. And um, four times in all, the spelling is with the sin instead of the tzadi. And that is um, the corresponding to the four expressions of redemption, like we have the four cups of wine on Pesach. Um, so so uh, the four times that Yitzchak is spelled as Yitzchak with a sin is corresponding to the four expressions of redemption as is found in the book of Shemos. Hashem said, V'hotseisi, V'hitzalti, V'goalti, I will take you out, I will save you, I will redeem you, and I will take you. Um, and, and that's why during the bris, it's appropriate when this is recited at a bris mila, that it's, it's, with the, it's used with the expression of Yitzchak, but with the sin, yis because the bris is directly connected to the promise of Eretz Yisrael to the land of Israel. So now we come to we're, 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 uh, chapter 105, verse 23. Okay, so verse 23, Vayovo Yisrael Mitzrayim, Vayakov Gar Be'eretz Cham. And Israel came to Egypt and Yaakov sojourned in the land of Cham. Now you'll notice over here that both names of Yaakov are, are used. Yisrael and Yaakov. And just to refresh your memory, um, oh, Wendy, we're ready past this. <laughs> we're at 28. Okay. So we're, 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 we'll go through these verses very quickly. Um, Yaakov and Yisrael are both names for Yaakov. Originally, the name given was Yaakov, but then when, when Yaakov fought with the angel and he won, he was given the name Yisrael, which is the superior uh, reference to, uh, to Yaakov. So in the beginning, Vayava Yisrael Mitzrayim, but then the, uh, the slavery ultimately took us down a peg or two. The Yaakov Gaba Eretz Cham. And then the chapter continues. Vayeferes Amar Ma'od Vayatzmehu Misara so he multiplied his nation greatly and made it mightier than its adversaries. He turned their hearts to hate his nation, to conspire against his servants. Uh, right, we said this last week, that in the beginning, the Jews were recognized for their amazing contributions and for their greatness. But when Hashem wants things to change, that's what happens and that's why the verse says hopach libam 
He turned their hearts. Not necessarily did it make sense that the Jews were treated this way. We know, though, that Hashem always sends the refua, the healing, before the sickness. Shalach Moshe Abdo, Aaron Ashabacha, Bo. So Moshe Rabbeinu, he sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. Some of them, Divrei Ososov, or Mov Simba Eretz Cham. They placed among them the words of his signs, miracles in the land of Cham. So if we want to look further into, into what this chapter is talking about, um, we go to the book of Shemos. What you will notice now as we continue from verse 28 is David HaMelech mentions the, uh, the plagues, the 10 plagues in Mitzrayim, but they're not in order and not all of the plagues are mentioned. And it's a very simple reason is because we already have the recounting of exactly what happened in the book of Shemos. So this is here, not here for the purpose of telling us exactly what happened, but rather the purpose over here is to point out the many miracles that Hashem performed for Bnei Israel, for the Jewish people. And not only were these miracles performed for the Jewish people, but these miracles were to give a very important message to the Egyptians as well and to the world at large. And that important message is and continues to be, you know, we have to mention and remember the going out of Egypt every single day. It's one of the six things that we're supposed to remember every day. You shall remember the going out of Egypt all the days of our lives. And Hashem brought the plagues to teach very important things, not only to Paro, but also to Bnei Israel, because we were in Egypt. God could have just um, teleported us to Eretz Yisrael. He didn't do that. Our being in Egypt was a necessary preparation in order to refine us and make us ready to receive the Torah, as we're going to see at the end. So what, what happened over there? He sent darkness and made dark, and they didn't defy his word. Now, we know darkness was one of the last plagues, but again, we're not doing this in the order. He turned their waters to blood, which killed their fish. Remember, the Nile was the source of sustenance in Mitzrayim. In Egypt, the Nile would rise and irrigate the land. They worshipped the Nile because that was their source of sustenance. So that was actually the first thing that Hashem smote was the river Nile and he turned it to blood. Also, if you look into the Midrash, you'll see that every single plague was also measure for measure, meaning that when Hashem punishes, he punishes measure for measure. The punishment fits the crime. Paro used to kill Jewish babies so that he could bathe in their blood. He was advised by his doctors to bathe in, the, in blood and um, the first plague was the plague of blood. And you can, if you look in the Midrash, you'll see every single plague was Mida, connected Mida, measure for measure. The idea being that everybody understood that Hashem runs the world and everybody is accountable for what 
they do. And then, of course, was there also, which you can read in the Medrash, the important message, how each plague shows Hashem's divine providence in every single aspect of this world. And that's why we see, in as we're going to go through the plagues, we'll see from the smallest, tiniest speck of dust to, to the largest creatures and, and, and great forces of nature were all part of the plagues that came upon Mitzrayim. Um, Sharats out some Sfardim, the Hadre Malchehem, Ama Vayava Arev, Kinim Bechal, Gavulam. Their land swarmed with frogs into the chambers of their kings. Nasan Gishmehem borrowed Aish Lehavas, the Artsam. He turned their rains to hail, flaming fire in their land. Vayach Gafnam, Osa E Nasam. It struck their vine and fig tree. Vayashaba ate Gavulam, and it broke the trees of their borders. That's how strong the, uh, the, the hailstones were. And David Hamela specifically talks about the things that it smote because. Gafnam osa e nasam, their vines and their fig trees. The vines were where they would get wine, which you can live without wine, but um, that was their uh, their enjoyment. Or to e nasam and the figs, that's more the idea of, uh, of nourishment. And even their security, the trees of their borders, these hailstones were so strong, and actually one of the things the Medrash points out is how Hashem put opposing natural forces together, that the, the, it was a combination of fire and ice. Again, to show this idea of divine providence, that normally fire and ice don't coexist, but in order to serve Hashem and to teach the lesson to the world that Hashem wanted to be learned from these plagues. So God caused these two opposing forces to coexist. The truth is we saw the same with the frogs. We said earlier that the, the, the frogs, uh, what was the expression used over here? Um, and they entered into the chamber of the kings Sages tell us that the frogs um, penetrated the walls and they went into the ovens, again, defying the laws of nature and even putting them their own selves at risk because even the animals understood the need that everything in this world is created for the glory of HaKadosh Baruch for the glory of Hashem. Ama Vayava Arbe Vayelek Ve'ein Mispar. He spoke and locusts came, grasshoppers without numbers. Says that when this plague came upon Mitzrayim, you couldn't even see the light of day because they were, they were so numerous that they covered up the light of the sun and they were so destructive that they destroyed all plant life, most of plant life. They consumed everything. Racious, lachal, Onam. And he smote every firstborn in their land, the first of all their property. We know this was really the culmination of all the, um, all the plagues. And Paro, who also was a firstborn, 
though, was not killed because Hashem hadn't finished with Paro yet. He still had lessons to teach him. Uh, oh, we did that. And he took them out with silver and gold, and none amongst his tribes was impoverished. This was the promise that Hashem had given to our forefathers that we would be in Egypt, but that ultimately we would leave with great wealth. Samach Mitzrayim but say some kinaf al pachtam alehem. The Egyptians of an Israel had fallen upon them. You know, the sages tell us that every Jew left Mitzrayim with 30 donkeys laden with gold, silver, and jewels. Paras Anon la Masach ve'eish la Ha'ir Laila. He spread out a cloud as a screen and a fire to illuminate the night. You know, we're just reading through this chapter. But if we take each verse, each pasuk, and think about the magnificent miracles that were wrought on behalf of B'nai Yisrael. It's an unbelievable thing. It's an incredible, incredible thing. And this is why we are supposed to remember Yitzhia Mitzrayim. A, because of all the miracles that were done. And B, why did Hashem do all these miracles? What was the purpose of all these miracles, which we're going to come to at the end, but ultimately, it was to prime us, to prepare us for the receiving of the Torah. And then we would go into Eretz Yisrael because that was really um, the purpose of our redemption, the purpose of our freedom, um, which sometimes gets forgotten. Everybody remembers the refrain, let my people go. And sometimes they forget the next word. In Hebrew, it's one word, abduni, so that they may serve me. Um, so imagine now this whole nation leaving Mitzrayim and Hashem spreads out a cloud like a screen and a fire to illuminate the night. As we traveled, there was this cloud that traveled with us constantly. And at night, we wouldn't be able to see the cloud. So at nighttime, it was a fire to illuminate the night out of nowhere. Sha'al, Yavesh Slav, Belechem Shamayim, Yaspiyem. Even with all this, with all these miracles and everything that Hashem provided for us, we tested God greatly. The man wasn't enough. So we asked and he brought quail and bread of heaven. He satisfied them. Pasach sorba yazuvu mayim, hochu nahar. Then there, there was no water in the desert. Look at these amazing miracles that Hashem did. He opened a rock and waters flowed. They streamed through dry places. A river. Why? Why did Hashem do this? Not necessarily because we earned it. In fact, we were quite a pain in the neck as a nation. As we left Mitzrayim, as we left Egypt. We had a lot of complaints and a lot of, we tested Hashem a lot, but God never gave up on us. Why? Because he remembered his holy word to Abraham, his servant. God made a promise. To Abraham Avinu, that he would, yes, we would go down to Mitzrayim, we would go down to Egypt, 
but ultimately he would redeem us and we would leave with great wealth. He would give us the Torah and he would take us into Eretz Yisrael. So we have the Zuchus Avos. We have the merits of our fathers. Don't let anybody put any kind of fear into your heart to believe, God forbid, that we are where we are and we are here to stay. Zocha Estevar Kodcho. Hashem remembers his holy word. He made a promise to Abraham, to Yitzchak, and to Yaakov, which we mentioned earlier. Lacha I'm going to give you this land. He brought out his nation amid ju jubilation, his chosen ones in song. He gave them the lands of the nations and they inherited the toils of the people, meaning the people had put effort into the land. And now Hashem said, welcome home. This is for you to enjoy. Why did Hashem do this? It's very, very important for us to read this last verse in the chapter. But Avor Yishmaru Chukav Vatorasav Yinsoru Halaluka, so that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise God. So all these amazing things that Hashem did for Bnei Yisrael, for the Jewish people, he brought the 10 plagues. He took us out of Mitzrayim with great wealth. He brought us to Eretz Yisrael. And ladies, it's really important that we should remember that it was bizchus, it was in the merit of the Jewish women that the Jews were taken out of Egypt. It was in the merit of the Jewish women that Hashem gave the Torah. It was the merit of the Jewish women that the Jews went into Eretz Yisrael. And we saw this time and time and time again from during the exile until the giving of the land of Eretz Yisrael that the women always kept their sight on the goal, always had the faith that no matter how dark things were, the women always knew that if Hashem made a promise, he's going to keep his promise. And even if things seemed to be dark, that was a temporary situation. And because of the women's faith, that is why the Bnei Yisrael merited to leave Mitzrayim. It's why there was a generation to leave Mitzrayim. It's why the Jews merited to receive the Torah. And the Arizal said that the women of the redemption, which is our generation, have the neshamas, the souls of the women that left Mitzrayim, that left Egypt. So we got to keep on trucking. We got to keep on having simcha in the knowledge that Hashem always keeps his promise. Yeah! Especially now, right? As we're coming to the nine days and these are days that we know the sages tell us they're going to be days now, they're days of mourning, but in the future, there will be days of mourning that will be come days of great joy. Let's and hope it this year. Amen, amen, definitely. And this brings us to chapter 106. Chapter 106 also begins with the word hallelujah. Notice I'm not saying hallelujah. Hallelujah, because it's 
Ka is Hashem's name. Praise God. Hodu la Hashem ki tov. Praise God for he is good. Ki la olam chasto for his kindness is everlasting. Um, so in this Pasuk, David Amelech continues in this verse and in this, sorry, in this chapter, chapter 106, to talk about the many miracles that Hashem did for us, took us out of Egypt, led us through the wilderness, brought us into the land of Israel. And we continue to test him mm. and to push the buttons and ultimately, finally, Hashem put us into exile. And the chapter begins with the word, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And the reason for this is that David Melech is telling us when he says hallelujah, hodu la Hashem kito, give thanks to Hashem for he is good. King David is saying to us, don't repeat the mistakes of your forefathers. Don't be a grumbling group of people. Hallelujah. Give thanks. Recognize the miracles. Recognize the goodness of your, of your, of your forefather, of your, of your God that he did for your forefathers and what he is doing ultimately for you. So, um, when we say, Hashem ki tov, give thanks to Hashem for his good ki olam chasto. His kindness is everlasting. The Me'am Lois says that what we should realize is the kindness of Hashem is not dependent always on our behavior. God is kind and God does kindness. And again, it's so important for us to realize this. Because we don't want to go to that place of doom and gloom. To look at B'nai Yisrael, to look at our journey, and to say, you know what? Maybe we don't merit. God does so much for us. Maybe we haven't done enough. But David HaMelech says, Hodu la Hashem ki tov ki chasto. God's kindness is everlasting. And God made promises to our forefathers, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and Bizchus of us, and in the merit of our great ancestors, we will continue to see Hashem's kindness and Hashem's goodness. And Hashem's goodness and kindness is so great. In verse 2, David HaMelech expresses, Mi Yemalel Gevoros Hashem, who can recount the mighty act of God, Yashmiya Kol Tehilasai, or proclaim all his praises. It's impossible. God does so much kindness and goodness that it's impossible for us to, to fully capture the goodness and the kindness of Hashem, of God. Um, not qualitatively and not quantitatively. There is so much goodness and kindness. And again, when we study Torah and we look at the things that Hashem has done for us and, and as a nation, it is humbling because we realize the greatness of our Kaddish Baruch Hu. Truth to tell, and we've spoken about this in Tehillim before, one of the reasons that we cannot recount all the kindness and goodness that Hashem has done for us is because there are so many miracles that take place on a daily basis that we're completely unaware of. We don't even know all the dangers that are around us and the, 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 the saving angels that Hashem sends to protect us. And the same is true of opportunities. 
all the miracles that we don't realize, all the good things that happen to us that really are miraculous. And that's why Tehillim is such a, 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 a transformative thing for us to do. Because when we read Tehillim, it is there to elevate our awareness of God's presence in our life and the kindness and the miracles. And the more gratitude we have in our life, the more humble we become, the more humble we become, the more room we make for Hashem in our hearts and the more room we make for Hashem in our hearts, the more room we have for others. And Lord knows that's something we really, really need more than ever right now. Um, so we're going to see the mighty acts of Hashem in this chapter. And not only that we learn the mighty acts of Hashem, but we know it's an integral part of our Torah that we give this over to the next generation. The whole Pesach is based on what? On the Haggadah. What's the Haggadah? The Haggadah is based on the mitzvah of the Haggadah You shall tell it to your children. Um, We use the expression over here, mi yamalel, who can recount? And this expression, yamalel, shares the root with the word in Hebrew that means to rub. Like one may rub ears of grain on a festival to extract the kernel. So um, the root word of the word to recount is a hint to us that alludes to refinement, to redeeming the good from the bad by extracting it from its encasement. And the Baal Shem Tov says that the mighty acts of Hashem are Hashem's judgments and decrees. They are called mighty because they emerge from God's uncompromising strong judgment. So... We can read this verse like this. Who can recount the mighty acts of God? Meaning who can rub Hashem's decrees? Who can soften them and wring out God's love from the encasement of his judgment? And the answer is one who proclaims all his praises. How can you recount all Hashem's praises? We just said it's impossible. The way to do that is by reciting Tehillim. So a person who recites the book of Tehillim, which is filled with praises of Hashem, has the power to transform Hashem's decrees to acts, decrees of kindness. And the, the, that's why the Tehillim have such power. The power is what? The power is recognizing the actions of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the kindness, gratitude is the root to eradicating judgment. And that's why we read Tehillim. It's such an important thing. We know there's a custom on Shabbos Mubarak in the Shabbos before um, the blessing of the new month, before Rosh Chodesh, to read the entire book of Tehillim, or if somebody can't read the entire book, but to read as much Tehillim as possible. Why? Because the strength of the month comes from the Shabbos, Mavarchim, from the Shabbos that blesses the month. And Tehillim has the ability to change harsh decrees to kindness. Because ultimately, even the harsh decrees are kindness. God is good. God is kind. Um, Ashrei, Pasuk Gimel, verse 3, Ashrei Shomre Mishpat, Otsa Tzedakah, 
Bechol Eis. Fortunate are those who adhere to his laws, who perform deeds of righteousness at all times. Um, so, continuing, Mitsuda says, continuing from the previous verses, this pasuk, this verse, answers the question to the previous verse. What was the question in the previous verse? Who can recount? Who can recount God's mighty acts and proclaim all of his praise? So this verse tells us the answer. Fortunate are those who adhere to his laws. So those who adhere to the laws of Hashem their dedication to the Torah's laws and the fulfillment of good deeds, that is the ultimate praise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the ultimate praise to Hashem, because a person who is dedicated to the Torah demonstrates the, great, the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu who gave the Torah. Um, or the Radak says, happy are the Jewish people if they adhere to God's laws. When they do so, Hashem provides them with abundant goodness, even when they rebel against him. He tolerates them for a long time, giving them a chance to repent. Certainly, if they would act righteously at all times, Hashem would respond to them in kind and they would never be exiled from their land. So uh, we know that the Gemara says it's impossible to perform acts of charity at every moment. Oset says here, Oset Sadaka Bachal Ace, who performs charitable acts at all times. That's impossible. So the Talmud says one of the ways to accomplish this is that this pasuk, this verse is talking about parents while they support their young children, or the verse refers to one who raises an orphan boy and girl and marries them off. And the truth is, even though each of us doesn't necessarily have an opportunity to marry off orphan boys and girls, but we should keep this in mind as we have opportunities to give tzedakah, and there are many wonderful organizations that help brides and grooms to get married, we should realize this is, this is a very big mitzvah to participate in this, uh, this charity. Zohreni Hashem, Bertzona Mecha, verse 4. Remember me, O oh God, when you find favor with your people. Be mindful of me with your deliverance. So David HaMelech sees that in the future, there is going to be a Golas, there's going to be an exile. Right now, they're in Eretz Yisrael. This great miracle has happened. The Oron has come back to its resting place. But King David says, remember, remember that even though B'nai Israel are going to be sent out of Eretz Israel because of their sins, God should remember their good deeds. And here uh, 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 there are those who say David Amelech is asking Hashem to remember him and to and to resurrect, he should be one of the ones who will be resurrected in the era of Mashiach. Radak says that David HaMelech is here asking Hashem for all B'nai Yisrael that, uh, that they should live, even though they're in exile, they should live to see the redemption. We should say this verse with great kavana, with great intent and concentration. Liros 
im nachala secha, to behold the prosperity of your chosen people, to rejoice in the joy of your nation, to glory with the nation that is your inheritance. So he starts off by saying, give thanks to Hashem for he is good. And now Hashem says, okay, we're acknowledging the goodness of Hashem. We know that you are good. So now David Amalek wants to tap into Hashem's goodness. Remember me and remember your people and think of me and think of your people so that I might participate in this great joy that will take place at the time of the redemption. We have sinned as did our fathers. We have acted perversely and wickedly. Um, so that's why we are in Golos. We are in exile. We repeated the mistakes of our forefathers. Our fathers in Egypt didn't contemplate your wonders. They didn't remember your abundant kindness. And they rebelled by the sea at the sea of reeds. When we learn about the events that took place in the Torah, the purpose of learning that is to recognize the, na the nature that we have been given. Sometimes we learn things about what happened in our history and we're shocked and we're surprised. And yet, at the same time, we continue to repeat the mistakes of our forefathers. So let us look at these stories from the Torah and let us learn not to repeat these mistakes. Why did they have that mistake? Because their faith was weak. Um, we know actually that when B'nai Israel were crossing over the Yom Suf, so they crossed over the Yom Suf and Hashem drown the Egyptians. But the Jews were still afraid. They were frightened. So what did Hashem do for them? He had the sea spit up the corpses so the Jewish people would be able to see that Hashem had in fact um, uh, saved them. So b when we see that having a weakened faith is, is a cause for not having betachem, for not trusting in Hashem and for rebelling. So those are areas that we need to strengthen ourselves. There's lots of things we can do to strengthen our faith. We can say to Hillim and internalize their words. This whole idea of telling over the history of Bnei Yisrael is to strengthen our amuna is to strengthen our, our faith. Yet he delivered them for the sake of his name to make his might known. Actually, I'm remembering with one of the conversations that Moshe Rabbeinu Moses had with Hashem when we were constantly trying Hashem and Hashem said, you know what, let's, Let's scrap this nation and start again. One of Moshe Rabbeinu's arguments to Hashem was, what's it going to look like? The world is going to look at this event and say, oh, you were strong enough to take them out of Mitzrayim, but you weren't strong enough to bring them to Eretz Yisrael. And that's Vayoshiem Laman Shamo. He delivered them for the sake of his name to make his might known. He 
he roared at the sea of reeds and it dried up. He led them through the depth as a desert. Um, he saved them from the hand of the enemy and redeemed them from the hand of the foe. So he saved them from the hand of Paro, who hated them, and he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy, as it says. Thus, the Lord saved Israel on the day out of the hand of the Egyptians. So some say the enemy refers to the sea. The sea is man's enemy, drowning ships by its many waves. This also refers to the Egyptian supernal angel that hated Israel. To begin with, the Holy One cast down their supernal prince and then redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. He saved them from Paro and his army. So we have a lot of things to contend with that we don't even think about. Every nation has an angel. Besides the things that we see in this world, there are things going on in the upper world. Whatever's going on down here is a reflection of what's going on up there. So when we talk about the many miracles that Hashem does for us, there are so many elements to what's going on that we're not aware of. And the, the narration continues, Vayachasu mayim sarehem echad mehem lo nasa. The waters engulf their adversaries. Not one of them remains, talking about the, uh, the enemies. So when the Egyptian, when they drowned in the sea, not only did they drown in the sea, but all the glory of that nation drowned with them. They were the superpower of the world. Not one of them remained. The Yachsutzamayim Sarehem, the the Friedrich Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson explains what's the meaning. Lo nasa. Echad um, mehem lo nasa. There was not one of them left. So the the Friedrich Rebbe explains they didn't bring echad, the oneness of God, into their lives. So they left no godly imprint after their demise. They came and they left. They didn't live their purpose, which is the purpose that everybody has in this world, which is to leave behind the lesson and the life of God, of oneness. So when they were gone, they were gone. Nothing was left behind. We know, Baruch Hashem, thank God, we have a Torah. We have many, many mitzvahs that we have an opportunity to do. And so this idea of echad, this idea of oneness is constantly a part of, of our journey in this world. And that's why when a person lives their life connecting to their purpose, to their essence, to their neshama, to their soul, then their journey in this world is eternalized. The echad that they brought into this world remains forever. And, and this is a very beautiful way to live one's life that we are here to fulfill this mission of bringing the oneness of Hashem into this world and that's how we are able to connect to our loved ones who are no longer here physically with us because yes their physical presence isn't here, but their connectedness to the echad, 
to the oneness we can continue on their behalf and, and and that's why when we memorialize when we remember a loved one by doing a mitzvah by bringing more godliness into the world then we live the exact opposite of what this verse expresses about Mitzrayim, expresses about Egypt. Because if you think about it, life is but very short. However long a person, even a person who lives a long life, a person lives a hundred years, even, the, even if you look at the Torah, they lived 120 years, 175 years. But what is that? In, 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 in comparison to time, it's really a very short amount of time. It's not the length of the years, but rather it is the accomplishment because when a person lives their life with this idea of echad, then the echad, the oneness, the godliness that they reveal in this world and they bring into this world, that is eternal. That is forever. So I'm going to leave you with that thought over here. Emit Sashem. We will continue next week um, in this chapter of Psalms. I wish everybody a healthy week, a happy week, um, even though even though we are in the week where we're going to begin the nine days of more intense mourning and, and, and we learn when we enter the month of Av, which is on Wednesday, we're supposed to decrease in joy. But there's another way of reading that instruction. When we enter the month of Av, which is a month of mourning, and destruction. Mamaitin, how do we decrease that concept, that concept of mourning, that concept of the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash? We decrease it besimcha with joy. What kind of joy? Of course, it has to be a joy that is permitted. But during this time of the year, we are forbidden to have weddings. We're forbidden to listen to music because we have mourning. But joy in a mitzvah, joy in Torah, joy in, 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 in being who we are, that is always, always permitted. So Mishanichnas Av, when we enter the month of Av, Mamaitin, we will decrease this concept of mourning and these days of mourning will be turned to days of joy. How? The through joy. Um, thank you. Thank you.